This was around late October, early November 2015. I, a 21-year-old male, was working at a sandwich shop in downtown Louisville, Kentucky. It was starting to get dark, and it was time to put the outdoor seating away. I go out the front door of the restaurant and look down the busy street. It's about 7 or 8 p.m., so everyone was starting to come out to go to the bars and restaurants. Half a block away across the street, I see an elderly man. Something is obviously not right with him. He looks see-through almost, very sickly. I notice that he is hyperventilating. I look closer and start getting more freaked out. Just the way he was breathing. I'm not going to be able to describe, but it was inhuman. His chest was heaving, but also going so fast at the same time. I've tried to breathe that way myself, but I just can't emulate that deep of a breath at that rate of speed. At this point, my mind is racing for some sort of logical answer. It has to be some homeless person messed up on some drug. But working where I do, I'm very familiar with most of the homeless in the area, and I've never seen this man before. I finish putting away the tables, go inside and explain to my coworker what I saw. She's hesitant to believe me, but we don't put much more thought into it. I go back up to the front, look out the window, and holy shit, it is almost directly across the street from the shop, looking me in the eyes. I literally couldn't move, couldn't say anything. It was like I was frozen in shock because what I was looking at made absolutely no sense. It had the face of an old elderly man with gray hair and solid black eyes, almost like the pupils were so dilated it took up the entire eye socket. The skin looked very transparent and sickly. It was still breathing all weird, with the chest heaving, causing all other parts of the body to follow it, and his mouth was hanging wide open, almost like his jaw was unhinged. But even more disturbing was his body. I didn't notice it before because it was at a distance and was obscured by traffic and pedestrians, but now I could see up close. His clothes were literally hanging off his body. He was wearing a generic red and black plaid shirt with blue jeans and possibly suspenders. I can't remember for sure. The generic old person attire. The clothes were not oversized, but were very wrinkly and looked like they were just blowing in the wind. His hands poked out of the loose shirt sleeves. They were the same shade of transparent pale as his face. I didn't notice or couldn't see his shoes or feet. People were reacting to him, but not as much as I thought they should have. When people walked past, they gave him lots of space and generally had concerned looks on their faces. It was how a normal person would react to a drunk homeless guy or someone who was mentally disturbed that was making a scene. At this point, a line was forming and I had to get back to work. The next time I looked out front about ten minutes later, he was gone. Never saw him or heard of anyone who saw him since. It was so weird. It gave me the weirdest feeling, and everything happened in slow motion. It was an interesting experience that I thought I'd share. I was living in a college town in East Texas during the late 80s. One night, after dark, I was driving to visit a friend who lived about seven miles out of town. Pine trees lined each side of the farm to Market Road, which had very little traffic in the evenings. There were no houses along that stretch, making the drive dark. Even in the daylight, there was nothing to distinguish when you were, what year or decade or era. I was surprised that night to see headlights coming toward me in the darkness. Even more surprising was the car was moving very slowly and was weaving back and forth over the center lane. I quickly pulled over to the shoulder, thinking that would be the best way to avoid an accident if the driver was drunk or something. My headlights fell upon a black, early 60s Buick four-door, and to my amazement, it pulled over on the opposite shoulder almost parallel with my truck. 
The Buick's dash lights allowed me to see the silhouette of a man in a hat. Not a cowboy hat, but the type of hat that men wore in the 60s all over the country. I kept watching to see if he was in some sort of distress or needed assistance, but he didn't move. He just sat there staring straight ahead. I probably should have been more concerned for my safety, but I felt compelled to check on him. I got out of the truck and walked across the road. I stopped a few feet from his car and forward of his door. He was a thin, older man dressed in a black suit and a narrow black tie. The dash lights made his skin look a dull green color. He was wearing sunglasses. He sat with his hands on the steering wheel and hadn't looked over at me once. His window was rolled up, so I asked if he was okay in a louder voice that seemed to be absorbed by the surrounding trees. He kept staring straight ahead. I knocked on his window. No response. I rapped harder on the window and asked even louder if he was okay. No response. Not a movement. Nothing. The hair prickled on the back of my neck and I slowly stepped backwards towards my truck, watching for movement of any kind in the car. As soon as my butt hit the side of the truck, I jumped inside and locked the door and continued to watch him for a few minutes. Nothing. I shifted in to drive and rolled slowly back onto the road as I continued watching through my side mirror. The Buick remained in place and I sped away. Upon arriving at my friend's house, I left the truck running and literally pulled her outside as I explained we needed to go check on someone down the road. I sped back to where I had left him. I ended up driving all the way back into town looking for him, but there was nothing. I have no idea who or what I saw. This happened to me about five years ago, while I had the privilege of working in a men's suit store while studying at a college in Cardiff, Wales. For anyone who is curious, Wales sits just to the left of England and directly right of Ireland. Cardiff is a nice city, nowhere near as big as England, but it has gone through some pretty rapid modernization of late. They've done a great job at keeping their historical architecture but there always seems to be a new Starbucks or Costa Coffee opening up every other week. Some of the buildings in the city center have shiny new facades that wrap around the ancient structures like a shell. This became more evident to me on my first day at the store. My interview for the job took place bright and early one February morning, and I remember how cold I was as I made my way past the hustle and bustle of early morning commuters. Having been a student for a year, I wasn't used to being around so many people this early in the morning. That being said, I wasn't really used to being up in the morning period. When I arrived a good 15 minutes before my interview was due to start, I was greeted by an immaculate looking man in a pinstripe suit who I quickly recognized to be my new potential boss. His name was Andrew. He was a friendly guy in his mid-fifties, silver gray hair and just looked how you expect a manager of a suit store to look. After greeting me, he took me down to the bowels of the building, where the staff room was located. We had to make our way down two flights of stairs, and through a hallway full of your standard retail fixtures. I remember almost having a heart attack when turning a corner, and coming face to face with a naked mannequin just standing there, with its hands on its hips defiantly. Oh, sorry about that. I stripped it yesterday as we needed the garment for another display upstairs. Not very modest, is he? Andrew said lightly with a chuckle. I laughed, too. I felt comfortable before the interview had begun. This guy had a sense of humor. When we entered the main stockroom, I was a little blown away. The walls, ceiling, and flooring were completely different to upstairs. They weren't just bricks, but old carved bricks. The only thing I can compare it to off the top of my head would be something that resembles catacombs. Big archways hung overhead in badly eroded red stone, and the tiles beneath our feet were a dark marble. Andrew, upon seeing my wondering eyes, began to speak again. 
Ah, uh, yes, I forget people are usually surprised when they walk in here. I guess I'm used to it. He opened a wooden door that led into a posh-looking staff room, complete with carpeted floor, a polished oak table, and a brown leather couch. What I found amazing was when I learned the basement down here, as well as the basements in all the neighboring buildings, all looked the same. They were once part of a Victorian tunnel, you see, that connected every building in the street. Some kind of evacuation tunnel. Andrew finished and indicated for me to take a seat. Two years later, I had finished my course in college and had been asked by Andrew if I wanted a full-time position while I figured out what my next step was going to be. Naturally, I accepted, as I really did love the job and the people I worked with had become like family to me. Life being the way it was, I found myself struggling to find jobs that although I was now qualified for, I lacked the experience in a similar field. It was infuriating. How could I have experience if nobody will give me a break? Another two years after becoming a full-time member of staff, I was still at the store, but I had managed to progress from part-time sales assistant to assistant manager, which was great for me as it meant a tasty pay raise and great for Andrew as it meant he could finally take more time off, take vacations, and be with his family. I actually really began to enjoy the extra responsibility, training new staff, delegating jobs, and helping our team to hit sales targets. We are now coming to the reason I am writing this, the reason I will never forget that place. It all went down one Sunday morning. Sundays, obviously being the quieter days of trade, only required a skeleton crew to run the store. This is usually a manager, me, and one other sales assistant, in this case a girl named Amy. I quite liked working with Amy. We were of similar ages. She was cute and really down to earth. Most of our quiet periods were spent talking about everything and anything about our lives, until we realized how much time had passed and began creating jobs to do out of guilt. One Sunday afternoon, after a pretty uneventful morning, I walked into our office just off the shop floor to email our sales figures to head office while Amy manned the front desk. As we had two sales floors, if someone went downstairs, either Amy or myself would have to go with them. Upstairs was suits and downstairs was accessories and shoes. One of our rules was that under no circumstances were customers to walk around downstairs unattended. As I began entering figures into a new Excel spreadsheet, I heard Amy's faint voice under the store's collection of non-threatening store music. If my memory serves me correctly, I believe it was Nickelback she was quite rudely interrupting. I reached for the knob of the hi-fi and turned down the volume. Want me to go? Amy called. I poked my head out of the office door. Sorry, what? An elderly lady just went downstairs. Would you like me to go, or do you want me to watch the shop floor and you go down? I looked back at the barely started spreadsheet, and then back to Amy. It's fine, I'll go. Maybe I can sell her a sports jacket and cufflinks, I said with a smile. Oh, do it. Amy giggled as I walked past her. As I made my way down the steps to the ground floor, I was surprised to find that nobody was there. The room looked pristine and untouched. I took a few steps forward and stretched my neck, looking along the rows of formal jackets. Amy? I called upstairs. I heard her shuffle along from the till to the doorway. Yellow? She asked. I thought you said there was a lady down here. There is. I watched her go down myself. She said again confidently. I walked the full length of the room past the shoe displays, to the changing rooms and back. Nope. No one here. Are you seeing things? I asked. Amy looked both confused and annoyed. What? Can I come down? She asked. Yes, but quickly. I watched as she made her way around the room and back. What the fuck? She uttered under her breath while pulling back the curtains of the changing room. See, just like I said, you're seeing things. I swear to God, this is freaky. I literally watched her enter the store. The doorbell even chimed. I smiled at her 
and she just walked down here. Amy finished. I noticed that color seemed to be fading from her usually rosy cheeks. Just then, I had a sinking feeling. What if she's gone down into the basement? I asked, eyebrows raised. Amy put her hand to her mouth in an oh fuck fashion. Ugh, what if she's senile or something and just went down there? Did she acknowledge you when you smiled at her? I questioned. Amy's eyes looked upwards in thought before returning to me. She didn't. I thought she was just being rude. Okay, go back upstairs. I'll go find her, I said, a little exasperated. I really wasn't looking forward to this part of the job. One thing I learned from working in the fabulous world of retail is you often meet people from both sides of the mental health spectrum. My second week working at the store, some guy politely used one of our changing rooms to try on a shirt, and in doing so, took it upon himself to urinate into the small trash can in there. Guess which rookie member of the team had the pleasure of fixing this problem? As I entered the basement level, the first thing to hit me was the void of total darkness. Funny thing about wandering around in the dark, you usually have some sort of natural light so you can at least see your hand in front of your face. But here, deep underground, if the lights were off, you were pretty much completely blind. My hand went to my left and frantically felt for the switch, and with a sigh of relief, I flicked it on. The fluorescent tube light bulbs flickered into existence for a few moments before bursting light to all corners of the basement. And as my eyes adjusted, I quickly scanned around. Nobody, I said with relief. The basement stockroom was quiet and untouched, and also a complete mess. It was all of our jobs to keep the stockroom tidy, but over the weeks of constant deliveries, it had become more or less a dumping ground, with crates stacked on top of each other. Another reason to not be wandering around here in the dark. As I began to turn back, thinking how it was going to be my sad duty to inform one of my colleagues that she's been hallucinating, I distinctly heard the sound of a refrigerator door closing. I quickly turned to the direction of the staff room. The door was closed, but the light from within seeped through the gap underneath it. My heart began to race. The old lady was here. She must have somehow navigated her way through the stockroom in the dark and was now making herself at home in our staff room, probably attempting to make herself a nice cup of tea perhaps. Without really thinking, I marched forward and pushed the door open. I was greeted with an empty staff room. The bags and coats hung neatly on peg hooks on the far wall. Cutlery lay strewn around the draining board and a dirty wash rag was lazily dumped on the top of them. My bad. I remember thinking that perhaps Amy and I had been coming down with something because now I seemed to be hearing things. Just as the worry began to subside, my eyes locked on the small fridge under the counter with its door ajar. Hmm, I thought, and gently nudged it closed with the tip of my shoe. It was at this moment my blood ran cold. Hello? Came a shakily elderly voice from behind me. It was one of those experiences where you are so afraid that time seems to slow down. I began turning in the direction of the voice extremely slowly, almost as if, on some level, I wasn't so eager to lock eyes with whoever was down there. I sighed again, just the empty doorway. I decided I wanted to go back upstairs, where the sanity seemed to be, so I closed the staff room door and made my way back across the stock room. Just as my hand gripped the door handle of the fire door, total darkness enveloped me. It was so sudden that I couldn't help but unleash the unmanliest yelp I've ever created. My hand instinctively fumbled for the light switch and toggled it on and off to no avail. The light was completely gone. Now retrospectively thinking, a normal person would have opened the door and ran upstairs, saying goodbye to this fucked up situation. But something caught my eye in the darkness. A light source. The light was emanating from under the staff room door again. 
This didn't sit right with me. A lot down here today didn't sit right with me. But in regards to the light, I knew how the electricity worked in the building. All lights on the basement level were connected at the fuse box. If one light goes, they all go. I'm by no means an electrical engineer, but I knew there was no way that light should be on. Now call it basic human curiosity or human stupidity, but I found myself moving towards the light, navigating around the crates until my hands were pressed against the wood paneling of the staff room door. I pushed it, and to my total bewilderment, I was greeted by one horrifying sight. All the cupboards were now open, their doors yanked wide displaying the plates and cups within. Over on the far wall, the coats and bags had fallen and lay crumpled on the carpet below in a pile. A newspaper I had got that morning during my morning commute which had been neatly folded on the staff room table, was now open, and the pages had been pulled out. I remember I almost couldn't breathe. It was a kind of terror I've never experienced before, or since. I became instantly aware of how alone I was down there. Hello? I heard the voice again, but this time closer than before. In fact, this time, it was right behind me. Now I'm not sure if this is a coping mechanism of the human brain, but I remember the complete inability to turn around and face the owner of this voice. I was aware of a presence directly behind me, and knew only too well that if I had turned in that moment, I'd have seen something that I'd be describing to a therapist to this day. My body went cold, the hairs on the back of my neck were raised, and I became aware of how annoyingly loud my heart was beating. I looked forward and noticed the bottom half of our small cordless telephone poking out from underneath one of the newspaper pages. The phone lets us make external and internal calls around the building. My hand slowly and shakily reached for it, still feeling the presence behind me and the unwillingness to turn around. I pressed INT1 and instantly heard the faint sound of a phone ringing followed by footsteps moving from one side of the store to the other above me. Hello, Amy said, amused. Amy, can you come down here please? I whispered, my voice very slow and steady. What's wrong? She asked. Please just come down here now, I said, this time with a hint of panic in my voice. The phone disconnected, and I heard the footsteps sprinting across the ceiling above and then silence. Hello? The voice sounded so frail now, and I swear I could feel it stepping closer. Somehow, being down here and going through this had made me ultra aware in a way that I haven't been since. Just when I thought I was about to crawl under the table with my arms wrapped around my knees, I heard the most amazing sound in the world. Hey, Amy said. I turned around to see her. She was very concerned. Hey, I whispered. Are you okay? I nodded slowly. I just want to go upstairs. I felt her arm go around mine, and she slowly escorted me out of the basement. A while after, I remember saying to Amy that she was my hero, that she saved me from quite possibly having a heart attack. She found the story interesting and would often ask me questions on what I think I would have seen if I had turned to face it. But I'm fine not knowing what it looked like. I sometimes wonder why I reacted the way I did. Why did I feel such intense fear? Was it my own insecurity and cowardice? Or had I sensed that I was in danger? Or was the voice even real at all? Perhaps I had simply imagined it. I think that's doubtful. I mean, I didn't create the mess in the staff room, and Amy had seen a woman walk downstairs. I don't know, but I do know that I'll always remember this experience. It will be my one unexplainable story. I'm pretty sure everybody has one, and this is mine. It took a while before I was willing to go down to the basement alone, and before I could even get used to it again, I ended up finding the job of my dreams, and so sadly... I ended up having to say goodbye to my friends at the store. 
Thanks for taking the time to read my story. In 2010, my 79-year-old grandpa died after one year of fighting leukemia, leaving my grandma alone. She didn't have any friends, brothers, or sisters. She only had her three children and her grandchildren. She was heartbroken and very alone. She wasn't used to that. My grandpa was always around. Because she was so lonely after his passing, her three children made a schedule so my grandma could eat with one of them every day. For four months, she didn't eat one dinner alone. This helped her in her grieving process. It helped her to not feel so lonely. We were happy we could help her in this way. So for four months, she ate with us or my aunts and uncles until an evening in July came. It was a special night because the Netherlands, the country where I live, played in the finale of the football championship. Our family and my aunts and uncles all had separate dinner parties with barbecues, etc. My grandma was tired and didn't feel like going to a party, so she decided to stay home and eat alone. It wasn't a big deal for her. She went to bed early. That night, there was a huge storm, and the phone to my grandma's house rang, but she didn't hear it. The morning after, she woke up and walked into her living room, saw the little light on her phone flickering, saying there was a voicemail for her. The voicemail was very, very strange, and I know it's real because she kept it, and I heard it. It began with a crackling sound, like there was bad service. Then you heard a metronome sound, the sound the little device makes that a musician uses. It was really strange. It went on for like 20 seconds. Then there was a voice. It sounded like the voice of an elderly woman. Very crackling and very weak. Also a bit far away, it said in Dutch. Hello, greet ya. It's Josephine. Where are you eating tonight? Silence. It's 11 o'clock where I am. Then there was the metronome sound again, and that was it. My grandma didn't know a Josephine. Neither did we. She saved it and played it for everyone in our family, but no one recognized the voice of Josephine. But it did give us the chills. Greet ya is the name my grandpa called her. No one else called her that. Her name was pronounced great. We found it very strange, and I had a feeling my grandpa was behind this. He wanted to know if we were still taking good care of her by inviting her to dinner every night. Maybe he made contact from the other side or something. But the question remained, why did Josephine call? A woman we don't know. A couple days later, my mother was cleaning our house. She found the obituary of my grandpa that was in the newspaper when he died. After his passing, she took out the entire page and folded it so that we only saw his obituary. She thought that it was time to store it, but before she did, she unfolded the entire page just to look at it, and there it was. Below my grandpa's obituary, a woman called Josephine. She died the same day as my grandpa, and she stayed in the same morgue the week after her death. They were cremated the same day, at the same crematorium. I believe that Josephine was stronger than my grandpa and helped him make contact with home. I really like that idea. This is a quick story of something that I went through with my grandfather that absolutely terrified me. My gramps was a great man that I looked up to throughout my life. His name was Lee, and in his older age he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. My parents kept it from my sister and I for a while because they didn't want us to worry and we didn't live in the same town. But we eventually found out when things started to get worse. It was hard on them, but my parents moved him into their house to take care of him. My grandmother passed away when I was just a kid, and he never remarried. My gramps was mostly okay, even after moving to the house. 
He would have an episode or a bad day, but a lot of the time he was pretty normal. As time went by, he got worse and worse. Within a few short years, he was like a different person. Several times when my mom drove home from work, she found him walking down the road. And when she pulled up to him, he had no idea who she was. Now let's get into the meat of the story. I had some time off and went home to visit. I told my parents to go ahead and take a little vacation, that I'd take care of Gramps. It was just for the weekend. How hard could it be? Well, it was hard. Very stressful. It's sad to see a man that you loved be so broken down like that. To try and get control of someone that is scared and having an episode when they don't even know who you are. Both nights I slept on the living room couch and Casey went for one of his strolls. The second night, I jolted upright on the couch and just knew something was wrong. I went into my grandfather's room and turned the light on. He was gone. I grabbed my keys off the table, jumped in my jeep and tore off up the street. I saw no one, so I turned around and drove the other way. But when I passed my parents' house, I saw light coming from the garage. I ran back into the house, through the kitchen, and into the garage. My grandpa was inside. He had his back to me. He was doing something. I approached him and said his name, so I didn't startle him. I got to his side and leaned forward to see what he was doing. My heart almost stopped. He was brushing his teeth with a box cutter. His lips and gums were destroyed, and it was like he didn't even know what pain was anymore. He didn't even care. I got the box cutter away from him and called an ambulance. They did a decent job putting his lips back together, but you could tell that some serious damage was done, and he really couldn't communicate anymore after that. My grandfather died several months later from complications of heart disease, and I still miss him. I sometimes have nightmares about the moment I saw him doing that. It's always me walking into some random room and seeing him with his back to me. And even though I usually realize that I'm dreaming at this point and already know what he's doing, I still have to look and see. And it's horrifying every time. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. If you want me to tell your story or read a creepypasta, email me at the address in the description. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Cory Rhino, C O R Y R Y N O. Be good to animals, even people. See ya. Okay, babe, so pick you up at 8 30. Yeah, and by the way, my dad is over here and he wants to meet you. He does? Shit. <clears throat> Who said that? Who the fuck said that? Uh, it might have been me outside, but I didn't say anything. I just knocked. Well, no shit. I admire your honesty. Uh, good. What's your name, fat body? How's it going? I'm Corey. Do you suck dicks? Uh, I haven't sucked any yet. Bullshit, I'll bet you could suck a golf ball through a garden hose. Well, maybe you could show me how it's done. What have we got here, a fucking comedian? Look, man, I'm just joking around. I'm here to maybe take your daughter to go get, like, a jelly donut or something. A jelly donut? Yeah. What is that? What the fuck is that? It's a fucking donut with jelly in it. Holy Jesus. I'll be watching you. Okay, so can we go now, or what? Let me see your war face! My what? Ah! That's a war face! Now let me see your war face! No! <laughs> no, 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 no. 
How was that? Hell, I like you. Thanks, man. I like you, too. And I'm going to be good to your little girl. He wanted to know if we were still taking good care of... He wanted to know... He wanted... He wanted to know if we were still taking good care of her. Remind me to kill you later. I'll make a note of it.